Today we bring you our latest progressive candidate. Liz Watson is our featured progressive of the day. Liz, how are you doing today? I'm doing, I'm doing great. great. Thanks, 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 thanks for having me on the show. show. I really, I really appreciate, appreciate it. it. Thanks, thanks, thanks for what you're doing for uh, uh, giving me a platform. platform. Well, you know, uh, I consider this a duty. And let me get rid of that echo. I think that echo should be gone now. I, I consider that a duty. But let me, let me tell our people a little bit about you. Liz Watson is a product of Bloomington, Indiana's public schools. She is a fifth-generation Hoosier. Watson went to Georgetown Law School. During law school, she represented victims of domestic abuse. After law school, she represented working people in low-wage jobs, victims of pregnancy discrimination, unemployment compensation denied, and other indignities working people suffer in the hands, at the hands of a rigged system designed to exploit them. Liz was the policy director for Democrat uh, for Democrats in the United States Congress. She led the development of the $15 minimum wage bill in the House and worked with Senator Bernie Sanders' staff for the companion bill in the Senate. She has also worked on progressive legislation with Senator Elizabeth Warren. After watching the current congressman <laughs> work against the people of her district, she did her civic duty. She decided to say, no mas. As my good old Panamanian boxer said, no mas, no mas, no more, no more. She is running to replace Trey Hollinsworth in Indiana's House District number nine. Welcome aboard, Miss Liz Watson. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Really great. Well, you know, we are, well, absolutely so. What we want to do is get, first of all, I want to tell you that we, we simply love your platform. Your Thank you. I appreciate that. Yes, your platform is just what I think everybody is looking for. Now, um, you know, the first, the, the first thing I want to ask you is what gave you the courage to run? Well, well after, after uh, you know, you Trey Hollingsworth came, came into Congress, Congress in the 115th Congress, Congress and, and after, after President, President Trump, Trump came in, and I watched, watched as, you know, everything, everything I care about. about uh, got on the shopping block, you know, safety and health protections that keep working people from dying on the job, uh, protections from discrimination and work on a federal contract, uh, clean air, clean water protections, uh, you know, efforts to 300,000 Hoosiers and millions of Americans off their health insurance. I felt like I had to do something. I had to step up and do something. And for me, I was watching this stuff happen on the home floor. And so it wasn't like you know, there was a TV screen in front of me that I was watching. It was in real time, and it was a, if it was a worker protection, I was fighting back against that effort to roll back protections. And then I couldn't do it because we didn't have the votes. And I had to acknowledge that, um, you know, it was time for me to try to step up and to try to vote for Hoosiers, try to fighting for Hoosiers uh, for a very long time. But if I was really going to make a difference right now, I, you know, I need to get a vote over us. Now, I, beforehand, why don't you tell us a little bit about your upbringing? I saw a video that you did about where you came from and sort of where your values came from. Why is it that we know that this is coming from the heart and this is not just somebody saying a whole bunch of words like we know a whole lot of people that are out there running right now. You, you've lived this. You've seen people who've lived it. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing and tell us a little bit about why you do this. Sure, I'm, I'm going to do that. that. So, so I'm, I'm from, from Bloomington, Indiana, Indiana and, you know, I grew up with this idea that what happens in Congress really matters. A lot of people sort of think of Congress as, you know, the stuff that happens in Washington that doesn't affect my life. Um, my dad was uh, the first in his family to go to college, and he got to do that because of the GI Bill. So he had served in the military, and his two brothers had, and three of them went to college because of that federal investment. And, and the reason that, that the boys had a roof over their heads when they were growing up was Social Security benefits, benefits which was another thing that Congress had done because uh, my, my grandmother, grandmother had survivor benefits after her husband passed away. You know, so, so I knew that I got, got to grow up, you know, in Indiana and have a nice middle class life, and, uh, and I did, but because of the things that our Congress had achieved. You know, and last year, when my dad got very sick, he had a medical and he was in a coma for four weeks. I had a family medical. I was able to be right beside my mom, you know, making sure that he got better. 
And then the 16th hospital state, that, that would, would bank, bankrupt, bankrupt anybody except, except for maybe Donald Trump, Trump maybe Trey Hollingsworth, but the rest of us, they would bankrupt, except that they need Medicare. And so that is why I feel like every single person in the country who gets sick deserves the right to have a fighting chance of getting better, and I think everyone should have that same standard of care, and this is why I support Medicare for All and the richest nation on earth. We can't afford not to do that for people. Now, uh, how is how, what kind of campaign are you running? So I'm running a grassroots campaign in all 13 counties in our district. It's a it's a big district that takes me about three hours to drive. Uh, it takes my uh, my campaign staff about two hours and fifteen minutes to go a little too fast. And, uh, you know, so I'm out there. We're walking. We're door knocking. We're building a movement. We're knitting together. The uh, uh, traditional progressive democratic the, the working class voters, voters in our district, some of whom uh, have, you know, voted, voted for Trump, Trump and are coming back, back if they're voting, voting for Democrats. Um, and, and what I'm finding, finding is that my message, which is about making sure that people can earn living wages, that they have access to health care, that they have strong public schools, that we don't gut our public schools through voucher, which Indiana has tried to do, you know, that we do things to stop mass incarceration, like decriminalizing cannabis, you know, that's a message people really lean into, they really relate to, because people want to be treated fairly, they want to be treated with dignity. And so this is a message that's committed together, a winning Democrat majority of voters. And, and, and that's what we're going to do to win. win. And, that's and that's why I have, you know, 23 new unions that have, that have supported me in this race, and that's really um, unprecedented. It's because I stand up for working class people, people and I fight alongside working class people. And it really matters that we have a candidate that are going to do that. And you can't just just pay the service to the teachers. And then, you know, I, I'm a worker for my company, I have worked on my work policy, and these things are really important to me. And it shows in my campaign. So I'm knitting together that really strong fabric position that we Now, Indiana is, a, is a sort of an interesting state because Indiana, I think, voted for uh, President Obama the first time. The second time, it didn't. Uh, Indiana had a, well, the, the person that is currently our vice president, uh, the, the governor, I think he, but I think he was in trouble, right? Uh, he was in trouble before he became the vice president. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you, if you, if you drive, drive down, down the road in Bloomington, you know, um, before, you know, before he somehow, somehow got promoted, <laughs> so-called, uh, he all, all of a sudden the fire might be. So that's, that's just, just a way to describe, to describe the feeling you're on the ground. Right? Sure, sure, he was, he was our like governor, governor, but, but you know, people, uh, people uh, were totally opposed to the things, things he was doing around targeting LGBTQ people you know, through his religious freedom efforts. Of course, businesses boycotted Indiana because of that. Absolutely. Yeah, and of course now he's trying to do that same thing in the country. Yeah, it, it's sad. I mean, especially since I think he probably took the position because he assumed <laughs> that he was going to eventually become the president. He knows what he's into, but we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. Now, um, you are considered a very family-oriented type uh, congressperson, especially for the types of jobs, that, uh, the type of work that you did. Why don't you tell us a little bit about, because what I want, what I want folks to get out of listening to you is that uh, you're not just there saying these words now. I mean, you've worked for the folks. Uh, tell us a little bit about the things that you've done for the pregnant woman that had problems, the person who didn't get uh, their compensation for uh, their unemployment compensation, etc. These are true progressive issues that right. affect a whole lot of people that generally just left, is left behind the curtain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you know, you know I, I am a crusader for economic justice, mm -hmm. and I will tell you that um, you know, you know I, 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 I am family oriented. I've got two kids, um, and they just came home from school, and I'm sitting at my house, so they might show up. <laughs> not a problem. Not a problem at all. <laughs> um, and you know, that's, that's what, what it is. is. Running a campaign, campaign and being a parent, parent and all the things. things. So, uh, so uh, they're, they're, you know, in public school, school they're 7 and 11, and um, they're, they're very, very important to me. And, you know, as, as a working parent, um, I have seen, you know, how, how, how challenging it is even, even with, with, with resources, resources, right? right? And, and I, I represented, uh, when, when I worked at the National Women's Law Center, I ran the Workplace Justice Project, um, and, and I was in legal services before that, and I had the opportunity to 
work, work with, with moms who were working, working you know, just, just as hard as they could, but uh, were discriminated against when they were pregnant. Things like, you know, needing a stool to sit on during a 10 hour shift. shift. Uh, uh, if you're, you're pregnant, pregnant you know, a doctor, doctor might, might say, you know what, you can't stand for all 10 hours, hours because it's not safe for your pregnancy. pregnancy. Or at a certain point, you can't lift, um, you know, more than 35 pounds. Now, now, not, not every person has those restrictions, restrictions but, but if in a physically demanding job, job you know, like, like a, a lot, lot of hourly jobs, jobs are, uh, uh, even just standing in your feet all day, there's a decent shot that the doctor's going to say there's a certain part of this job I need you to, you know, lay off of during your pregnancy to be safe. And when employers said no to that, which, you know, most employers say yes, but for those who say no, you're jeopardizing the paycheck and you're jeopardizing the pregnancy. So, you know, you know because, because you're making a woman choose between whether she's going to hold on to her job or whether she's going to have a baby healthy pregnant, right? And if she can't hold on to her job, how is she going to feed her baby? And since upwards of 80% of women and men, men don't have any medical, medical, medical leave, if she uses all of that, you know, time off, right, because her employer will accommodate her just to have a baby healthy pregnancy, she's going to have to go back to work right after she has the baby. You know, where's the justice in that? So, so yes, yes, I worked both for the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, which, which is legislation, legislation that would stop that practice, practice and say, you know what, you got to just give people those simple adjustments at work. work. It's not so hard. hard. Let's take, take care, care of it. Uh, but, but then, then I also uh, was, was part of litigating this issue under the Pregnant Discrimination Act, saying, you know what, under existing law, we ought to recognize existing law as protecting women who are in situation. So. You know, that's, that's just an example of the kind of thing that happens and flies under, under the radar. Um, it's really hard for women in low-wage jobs to get representation. Um, and it's hard, you know, when you're not, unless you're in a union, it's pretty hard to stand up to your employer right. because if you put your neck on the chopping block, you know, the likelihood of getting fired is just so great. Now tell me a little bit about your support for the family fact. Sure. So um, actually, I think... Was it, uh, Monday, Monday, I believe, was, was the 25th anniversary, anniversary of the Family Medical, Medical Leave Act. And, you know, of course, course that's uh, a really, really important legislation that gives uh, people time off to be with their families or for their, it's actually used most for people who are sick of themselves that have a serious health condition. Um, but the fact is, actually, so many people can't even access that, that, that unpaid, unpaid time off because they don't meet the requirements under the FMLA. FMLA. So um, when, when I was the labor policy director in the House, I had the opportunity to uh, help develop legislation to expand who get access to Family Medical Leave Act. That matters. But I also fought for paid Family Medical Leave. And that's so important. A lot of people can afford to take that unpaid time, right? You know, you know, so, so if, if you have, have to take, take time off and you don't get a paycheck, paycheck how do you do that? that? You know, if, if you're, you're living paycheck to paycheck, paycheck and you miss one, that can, can be the difference between having a roof over your head and not. So, so we need to pass paid family and medical leave. There's, There's a bill in Congress called the Family Act. It's, it's so smart. smart. It's, it's a small payroll tax on employers and employees. It's like, like every time somebody has a baby, should an employer, you know, just throw up their hands and say, you know, I can't believe it. What am I going to do? Somebody has a baby. I have no idea. You know, we don't have to be at the wheel every time, people. We can, you know, we're the only industrialized nation in the world not to do this. What's wrong with us? You know, and it's smart for families. It's also smart for employers. I think it's important for people to also realize that uh, one of the reasons you have to have legislation is because you need to have a, a, an equal playing field. If you don't, in other words, if, if, if a benevolent company decides to provide that and, uh, and one of its competitors uh, do not, does not, then it means that that person is at a competitive disadvantage. What government's job is to do is to create some ground rules so that everybody is competing with the same, with the same rules. And that, uh, I think that is something that a lot of uh, our candidates, uh, sh- when, when, when they get pushed back on this particular issue, to point out, you're just leveling the field so that one employer can abuse while the other one does. Well, and the other thing is, you know, our, uh, what's called labor force attachment in terms of the number of women we have in the workforce has fallen behind other countries because we don't have these things. So we are leaving money on the table. We could be more productive. We could have better economic growth if we made it so that women who had babies could be in the workforce. And other countries are doing it, and it really would help us. So we would actually, you know, um, increase our economic growth exponentially if we just enacted paid family, family, family leave and acted, acted like what, what it is, which is a common occurrence, right? <laughs> um, today, most, most everybody's, everybody's working. working. You know, mm-hmm. There is that, you know, 
sort of, you know, old notion of somebody's at home and somebody needs work. Probably everybody in the household is trying to bring in some money because it usually takes everybody pitching in in order to cover the bill. So, no. yeah, go ahead. You know, there's another issue. Uh, I don't remember what it's called. This isn't the Family Leave Act, but this is where uh, uh, the the bill that helps uh, parents with daycare. What is it called again? Uh, uh, the Child Care, care for, for Working Families, families Act. Right um, now, how, how? What's your position on that? Where Where are we with that? So, so I'm, I'm a, a strong, strong advocate for um, helping, helping to. to Get universal, universal access, access to pre K, mm -hmm. but, but also to, to cap you know, the percentage of people's income, income that spend on child care costs. Because, because right, right now, you know, child, we, we talk, talk about the student crisis, crisis. there's mm -hmm. actually a child care affordability, affordability crisis. crisis. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, we're, we're not meeting the need at all in Indiana for pre K, or I think it's uh, uh, something like 25% of children, children who are pre-K pre eligible and income eligible actually get access to a pre-K program in Indiana. And, and you know, the other three quarters are on to try. Um, that's crazy. You know, you know the zero, zero to five years are so important, important and, you and you can't, can't get, get that, that time back. back. You know, you know, you know the stats. It's a right. every dollar invested, it's a $7 return. So we need to figure that out. But beyond pre-K, we also have to figure out child care assistance and help paying for care because it's so unaffordable for so many families. The other side of the issue that people don't talk about that I think about is we need to make sure that that assistance is at a level that's going to pay providers a living wage. Exactly. Exactly. I um, talking to a mom who had three beautiful children and she herself is a child care provider and she's, uh, you know, she's going to school to get her certificate in early childhood development to be able to, you know, she said it's this is what I believe in, it's what I love doing, I want to be the best child care provider I can be. She's spouting off all these, you know, statistics and facts and information to me about how important early childhood development, you know, the early years are. And she said, so I want to be the best I can be at this, but guess what? I earn $10 an hour and I'm not going to be paid for going through this program, you know? And that's so wrong. You know, she can't afford to put her own kids in the air. I mean, that is sad. You know, yeah. and, and so, so we, we need to fix that. We need living wages. Um, that's, that's some of the most important work there is. And well, you've actually worked on that with Senator Sanders. I think you wrote a part of that bill. Isn't that right? Yeah. So um, I had the uh, wonderful honor of leading the development of the minimum wage bill in the House and working with Senator Sanders' staff because they were the... So my former boss in the House, uh, Bobby Scott, and Keith Ellison uh, co-sponsored at the original sponsors of the Raise the Wage Act, which is the $15 mm -hmm. bill in the house, and then Sanders had it in the Senate, the Sanders Murray bill, so I got to work uh, with their staff. And yes, it, it was really important to me that we got uh, the House members to, you know, get behind a $15 minimum wage, which is really the minimum we ought to be talking about and as a living wage. And you know what? It's still pretty hard to live on $15 an hour. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but but it's, it's so important, important to, to really figure out what we're going to do to get the minimum wage in Indiana and uh, 20 other states, which is a 7 to 5 an hour up, wow. you know, because right now, I mean, it's just criminal that we have people who are working as hard as they can, living in poverty, nobody can get by on 7 to 25 an hour, nobody. Now, you have uh, organizations like the Heritage Foundation and other institutes that are attempting to make people believe that somehow raising the minimum wage is going to affect uh, employment. Uh, all the studies that, have, that I've seen thus far dispute that altogether. And in fact, anybody who studied Economics 101 knows that if you give people on the low end some more money, that goes directly into the economy, which means you get economic activity, which means you get more production. So... Um, how uh, and in fact, what, there's one other thing I want to say, Liz, and that is, many of the people who oppose the fifteen dollar uh, 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 an hour wage are some of the people who are making less than fifteen dollars because someone has gotten to those people to put the fear into them that, well, at least you're getting ten dollars. Suppose you get zero. What do you have yeah. to say to that? Yeah, no, that's that's, that's a, a really, really good point. point. Um, you, you know, know just, just to sort of start, start with, start with that, that, I believe, I believe that, that when we invest in people. people you know, and that can be from increasing wages to making sure that everybody has access to a good education and to health care. When we make investments in people, that's when, you know, we're all able to do our best and contribute to the economy. It makes the pie better for everyone. When we don't invest in people, 
that's, that's when we're left fighting, you know, over crumbs. crumbs. And that's, that's what's, what's happening today. today. And, and so, so when you hear somebody who's earning a ten dollar wage say, say, Oh my gosh, you know, I, I'm, I'm afraid, afraid that the minimum wage goes up, somebody's gonna have more than me. Right. right. That's, that's about, you know, um, a sort of corporate donor class that has really pushed this idea that we should all fight over crumbs and that we can't make a pie bigger for everyone. Well I disagree with that entirely. So, so I, what, what you said, said is right. right. You know, no, let's, let's see. see. If, if we have, have a, for example, a tax break, break uh, for, for a giant, giant corporation, corporation the one percent, and we hand over a huge lot of cash to all of them, do we, we think, think that they're, they're going to go right to the grocery store, store and spend no. that? Um, you know, no, buying a little bit of bread or a milk or paying your child care provider? No, they're going to put it in the offshore bank account. That's what they're going to do with the money. But if we give money to the lowest paid Americans, they're going to spend it to meet their needs. And, and that, that is, is what makes the economy go around, is that consumer spending. You know, I think the other thing to say to people who want to say the sky's going to fall, and of course, that's what was said. We've increased the minimum wage 22 times since 1938. It's been over decades the last decade. But it's been increased 22 times. So if you want to look at what happens when you raise the minimum wage, just look at the 22 increases. It, it did not lead to job loss. loss. So, so you know, you know, I, I think, think that the folks, folks that want to throw stones, stones like that, that um, might want to actually know their history. Right? Uh, even beyond that, uh, there are two states, and I don't quite remember which two states they are. I think I want to say it's Kansas and Missouri. I, I'm not. I could be wrong. One raised the minimum wage. One didn't. And then they compared the economies on both sides, uh, and what you saw was one economy strived, the other one didn't. There was a particular interview that I did with a CEO in, I think it was, uh, where's Brownback from? Kansas. Uh, mm -hmm. Where Brownback is, and, and um, when Brownback did the big tax cut and all these things, this guy, this CEO jumped ship and went right across the river to Kansas, Missouri, right? And uh, Kansas City, Missouri, I think. Yeah, and, and what, what they found out is that, uh, uh, you know, there, there is some merit to having, the, you know, we need to learn, uh, or rather, progressives need to u use the right terminologies. Taxes are investments. Taxes used for programs are investments in people. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, it's a shame and you I can't. I believe in investing, investing in people. people. I mean, Absolutely. You know, and I, I, I worked really closely, closely with economists mm -hmm. on developing this. The, the, the $15, dollar, uh, yes. It, it does, does some, you know, you know and, and, and we wrote, wrote what I think is a really smart bill uh, that, that is really going to make a difference for people, and I'm going to get it and pass it. You know, you know I'm sick and tired of talking to the, the mom who tells, tells me, I'm a home care worker. And this is another mom I was talking to who had two kids. She said, I'm a home care worker, and I'm only, you know, $11 an hour, and that's, that's above the median wage for home care workers in Indiana. You know, I can't get by. I'm just scared that, that they're, they're going to do, do away, away with Medicaid, Medicaid which is what, you know, funds uh, my work and pays my salary, and scared I'm not going to serve my clients, who I love, and I can't support, support my family. family. You know, you know she's, she's doing, doing, I mean, could, could there be, be more important, important work, you know, than, than, than taking care of seniors and people with disabilities in their homes? But really important work, and we're undervaluing this work. And, you know, this is work that, like, 90x percent done by women, and, you know, those, Those kind of low wage service sector healthcare jobs, jobs are very disproportionately done by women of color. Um, we need to do better. And we now, need to start valuing that work. You know, and, and you know, there's another, n another thing that we have to st start pointing out, and I wish we were more aggressive as progressives in doing so, and that is paying low wages is a tax cut yeah. for the wealthy. And not only a tax cut, but it's an abuse because when those folks have to go on welfare or when those folks go to the hospitals and we have to take care of them, those of us who are otherwise paying these bills, it is out of our pockets that these low wages are, you know, I, 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 that are that they're affecting. So in reality, we are doing it's a double whammy that they're paying yeah. low wages to hold on to money. And then they're getting monies from the taxpayers to take care of the workers that they, they hadn't paid correctly. So it's a, it's a hit twice. You're, You're absolutely, absolutely right. right. And, and let's, let's talk, talk about, about you know, one, one of the best, best ways that we could raise workers' pay tax. Mm -hmm. We could Tell strengthen them and organize and bargain. We could, we could make, make sure, sure that everybody has the freedom, freedem to come together with co workers and negotiate for their fair share. Um, we, we know, know that, that when people are in unions, unions they're going to earn a third higher wages, wages, they're going to have benefits. When, when there are union jobs, and there's a lot of union jobs in a community, non-union wages are higher, they're going to keep up. 
you know, you know this, this is, is what, what happens. happens. Um, um, and, and so, so it's, it's really important that we fight back into the union busting. You know, you know and, and so these, these days, um, something, something like three quarters of employers, employers during the union organizing drive hire union busters. busters. You know, you know, to, to try, try to stop, stop organizing drive. drive. And, and so, so when, when you see this all out of assault on unions, unions um, um, it's, it's really clear that what we have to do is make sure that we have the best of the unions. You know, I, I, I do believe that unions are the backbone of the middle class in this country, and that if we're going to get back to having a strong middle class again, we're going to have to get behind our unions and make sure that we don't allow them to get it through right to work. And that is why, I, I, well, I, I need to say this, but before you say that, you just said right to work. Uh, folks, right to work is the, another right-wing term used to say right, right, to, uh, right, right not to get paid what you're worth. That's mm-hmm. what it really means. It's not right to work. Texas, where I'm at, is a right to work state. It means unions be darned. But anyhow, there is a reason why over 23 unions uh, endorsed you. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So um, that's that's been been really one of the the wonderful wonderful things about this campaign has been been, fighting alongside uh, men and women in unions, you know, know, to stand up to the abuses abuses that they're they're facing. Um, You know, know, as you may know, know, uh, President President Trump Trump came here during the campaign and and said that he was going to save all these jobs at the carrier plant. Right. And he was going to stop them from going to Mexico and that, you know, we've done this great deal, which is a giant tax break, of course. Guess what? The jobs went in and we've now lost over 600 jobs. And so I stood with workers um, outside the carrier about three weeks ago when 200 more workers were losing their jobs. You know, they're talking about, if they are going to go, you know, people who are earning $17 an hour here, those jobs are now going to be done for $50 an hour in Mexico. Wow. And Trump didn't lift a finger to stop it. Um, you know, it's really a terrible thing to be um, in that situation. I mean, if you really think about what it's like to walk out of the plan for the last time and it's provided a livelihood, as you know, it has done for so many people, uh, and, and have no idea where you're going to go next. And that's the situation that these folks are in. Um, I strongly believe that if we are going to get back, as I said, to have a robust middle class, we're going to have to do things like uh, back against right to work. I support better legislation that would uh, repeal uh, the Taft Hartley uh, provisions that allow states that, like Indiana and Texas. To enact right, right to work, work for less laws. laws. Um, I, I also think we need to strengthen the National Labor Relations, Relations Act. And when I was the Labor, Labor Policy Director in Congress, Congress, I got to work on some legislation, legislation that, that would do that, that, that would put, put real teeth into the act, create real damages if an employer, um, you know, fires somebody during an organizing drive, help put people back to work quickly, make sure that they can go to court just the same as anybody else if, you know, the employer acts um, unlawfully. This stuff is actually really important. We're going to have to do these things because right now, you know, it's kind of a slap on the wrist if, some, if an employer union boss, and so they do. They, you know, they do it and they barely get punished. Well, look, we are coming close to the end, end, end of this, so uh, what I want to ask you to do is tell us you're in Indiana, and there's things specific to Indiana I couldn't possibly know. And likewise, there are things that I probably should have asked you that I didn't. So yeah. what, did, what would you like to uh, close out with telling? And then I have a request to you after you tell us all that, you, all that, all that I didn't ask you or that you haven't said thus far. Okay. I have a, a, a mission that I want to ask you to join. <laughs> okay, okay, got you. So, um, you know, what I think folks here you know, our feeling is the sense that we have currently, we have a first-term Republican incumbent in our seat who's voted against shooters every single time, no matter, you know, what issue it is. He's guaranteed, he just, he just introduced legislation to make it so that uh, predatory payday lenders can't be held accountable. I mean, he's on the side of big banks, he's on the side of giant corporations, he's not on the side of regular people. But the thing that actually bothers people about this guy is that he doesn't, doesn't meet with people and he doesn't, doesn't listen to us. Um, I think that we have a great shot at taking back our district. And it's because of all the people in this district who are refusing to sit down. They are insisting on being heard. They are insisting on having a voice in the decisions that are currently being made in Washington about us, entirely without us. And so I've been holding town halls because of my representative law 
across the district on the issues that matter to Hoosiers. And I'll tell you, there's trouble showing up town hall theory, a little contract. <laughs> I like that. Now. Um, you know what? I show up and, and so do Hoosiers, Hoosiers across the district. And we have a lot of good ideas. There are a lot of smart folks here in southern Indiana. And I believe that if we had true representation, someone who actually listened to them, we would be a lot better off. Um, because you know what? There's a lot of ideas here that are a lot better than a lot of the ideas floating around Washington. So. Um, so, um, that's so that's what I'm doing. doing. You know, it's, it's about, about true representation, representation and that really, really matters. Well, Liz, it seems like you're doing a great job. Now, let me tell you a little quick story here. Um, you know, we do, we do, um, uh, we are a radio station here that, or I shouldn't call it a radio station, it's a radio, audio, video, everything a station that uses the internet as its transport to get it out to thousands of people. Uh, just recently, actually, between today and yesterday, Facebook changed its algorithm, which means whereas if you had been on yesterday, you would have had uh, in, in real time. I mean, we'll get your, uh, this in the form of a podcast out to thousands of people. But in real time, you would have had several thousand people by now who would have heard you and seen you on this show. With the algorithm change, and the reason for the change of algorithm we all know is to continue the growth of the shareholders' value no matter what, in as much as most of the people who get onto Facebook, most of the people who go onto Google, they are commodities that these guys reap for free. Just like the telephone system is a uh, is is uh, what is it regulated? Mm -hmm. I think when you get into Congress, you should consider the effect of social media on our body politic, mm -hmm. and realize that it must be open because if if it is required that. Thousands of small independent publishers and media folks have to pay twice. And why I say twice is we are bringing our domain to Facebook, Google, and everybody else. And at the same time, they would want you to pay more, again, mm -hmm. to have the viewers that you brought mm -hmm. to know that you're on. So, I mean, uh, these are some issues that I hope that uh, that that folks take on because it, it is a form of reducing your democracy and also your viability because unless the people at the top says, well, Liz Watson, let's give her play on MSNBC and CBS and NBC, you get no other avenue. So I hope that uh, those are things that within your platform you consider thinking about as well. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm, I'm definitely, definitely going to be fighting, fighting for a free and open internet, internet, and I believe that it's essential to our democracy today. On, on the, the subject, subject of the internet, internet really quick, net I wanna, neutrality. Net <laughs> neutrality. I want to let folks know that the, the way, way to find, find me online, online is Liz or Liz F O R Indiana dot com. So, so you, you can also follow me around the district, district on Facebook. Facebook. That, that would be really fun. And that's at Liz for Indiana. Indiana. So, so please, please do consider checking it out. out. Consider supporting my campaign. I would really appreciate that. Let me just let you know that you're, I, I made sure and had Liz for Indiana dot com right under your face. So that is, uh, that is right out there. And it is great. Thank I, you. I, I love what you're doing in Indiana. You're a great progressive. Now go out there and win the district. Okay. okay. Plan. It's Thank been a pleasure speaking to you folks. This is Liz Watson, our next, our, the, the person we want to be, the, or the person that several folks want to be the next progressive in the 9th District of Indiana. Thank you so kindly for having been with us. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a great Bye. day. Bye-bye.